And today we are interviewing Ralph Baer, who is known for being the inventor of video gaming. Hello, Ralph. Uh, hello there. <laughs> Pleasure Hi. to be here. Thank you. Oh. Pleasure to meet you too. Thanks for allowing us to interview you. So, um, tell us a bit about yourself, about what makes you famous, so that the people who don't know you get an idea about who you are from your perspective. Well, I wish a few people less would know me, because I'm so busy answering mail and email. I have no time for anything else. <laughs> now, uh, uh, I've been a television tech engineer, first a technician engineer for many, many years. I'm 91 years old. Still work, still crank out new toys and games. Uh, I don't know uh, whether you remember some of my games because many of them went into Germany. Uh, the game Simon, for example, 1978, that became uh, what was the German name for it? Senzo. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, still around 40 years later in the stores and in a much more complex form. But, uh, okay. <clears throat> Uh, I graduated as a television engineer after World War II. I was in the Army for three years, and all self-taught. I went to school, got a degree in television engineering, so I, I've built television studio equipment, I've built television receivers, so I know both sides of the, of the equation. You know, several times, especially in the early 50s, the thought occurred to do something with the television set other than just watching a stupid programs that were on, you know. And back then, uh, I mean, we had a choice of maybe, what, two or three stations in a major city, and maybe one in a place like where I am, Man Manchester, you know, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> there wasn't much to look at. Uh, but n nobody was interested in doing anything. The thought came back in uh, September of 66. I, by this time, I'm a major manager. I run the military electronics division of a big company that eventually became a Lockheed company, Lockheed Martin, now BAE company, uh, with about 300 engineers, technicians, support people. Uh, uh, so that was pretty close to the food, top of the food chain. There was a president and executive VP and me. So I had lots of uh, freedom to do things I wanted to do. Uh, I decided to put a guy on a bench in a little room that we set aside figure out how we can move spots around on the screen of a television set. Uh, that didn't take very long. Uh, and starting about March of uh, 67, we began to develop game after game after game. We wound up about a year and a half later with a brown box, which game number seven, and became the Odyssey game of 1972 by Magnavox. The Odyssey game was a uh, commercial version, a clean, cleaned up uh, version of my brown box. It played uh, ping pong, handball, volleyball, light gun games, chase games, and a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, uh, and that started the industry. Uh, and actually, actually, if I remember correctly, there are a few stories about how you got the idea to invent a, a box to connect to the television. Um, what was the real story behind it? I mean, I read one version of the story that you were in a in a tram or subway, and you, no. you have been bored, and you got the idea what what you could do with the televisions that that, that are in the households nowadays. That's, that's close, but no cigar. Uh, a, yeah, I was in New York on business, sitting around for another engineer to come in to join me to go see a client, and the idea recurred to me, and I made some notes, and when I went back to the office next morning, I wrote this five-page paper. Uh, you can probably see all that stuff just by going to you know, uh, various websites. My own website is you know, ralphbear.com. Uh, I think it's on there. Or you can go to the Smithsonian website, you can find it there. Or just look for ralphbear.com. There's tons of stuff out there. Yeah, <clears throat> altogether too much. Yeah, uh, but this time, in, you know, this is uh, 66, I'm in a position to do something. I'm up there. I'm up the food chain. I'm no longer an engineer trying to get permission to do something. I'm the guy who decides what to do. So I put uh, Bill Harrison, technician, later engineer, 
to work, to build you know, the hardware. And as we went along, ideas came. And by, the, by December of 67, we were already playing in ping, uh, ping pong. Uh, if we had known that all we needed was ping pong, we could have quit there. But who, yeah, who can read the crystal ball? You know, we keep adding stuff, adding stuff, which makes the machine more and more expensive, or more frightening looking to somebody, you know, who's never seen it before. So when we paraded uh, television set manufacturers to our place to see if they would be interested in taking a license, they all liked what they saw, uh, but they were all afraid to take a chance, except Magnavox. And we got a, a relationship with them. Of course, of course, you were creating a new industry, and the question was, nobody knew where it would lead to. I mean, it was totally new. In fact, the the uh, the press, uh, the radio, television press for about six months kept talking about the the, the magic product coming from Magnavox. I knew nobody, nobody knew what it was uh, until it came out. Uh, first, it was first shown in May of 1972 at various dealerships around the country. I attended one in New York, in uh, Central Park, in a restaurant there, sitting among, among a bunch of dealers looking at the 1972 uh, product line of Magnavox. And the final thing they showed, after they showed the camera, and they had a video camera, a new television set, it showed uh, the Odyssey game. And everybody uh, applauded. Uh, and I was sitting there, Wondering whether I should get up and jump up and down. <laughs> Very good. So, yeah. may I ask you, um, what was the main reason for the company to put you down, and what was the main reason for Magnivox to say, "This is our guy. We will make the brown box a new product for us." Well, uh, it was never meant to be a product for us. There so were about eleven thousand people in the company, and not one of them was associated with commercial or consumer products. It was all mostly airborne equipment uh, yeah, and to submarine warfare equipment. <laughs> and nothing to do, we had no experience, no relationship to commercial or, 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 or consumer products whatsoever. So we knew from uh, the get-go, from the start, that we had to have uh, a licensee. The question was, who is the licensee? Yeah. My first idea was that the cable business might want to be interested. And I contacted the teleprompter who were uh, among the, the two major uh, cable companies at, at the time. This is, this is uh, 1967, at least 67. And uh, actually, a uh, VP came up in a blinding snowstorm in December 67. We demonstrated ping pong and a few other things. And he brought up the president of the company, who at the time was Mr. Cable, who was a big wheel, came up in this big Cadillac limousine in an out-of-lining snowstorm in January of 68. And we went to a contract, and I did the technical portion of the contract, and our lawyers did the, in the, in the contractual part, and then they ran out of money. You know, cash flow, the cable company was negative. The whole idea was the cable company can put up nice looking backgrounds. All you have to do is point a camera as a picture or play a, a moving a moving scene. How about Wimbledon, right? Tennis court at Wimbledon with little characters running across, you know, like the kids do who uh, pick up the balls. And we can put that in the background and key our, our primitive rectangles of players and the ball on top of it. On top of that, the uh, origination station at the cable company, they can put some players up. And uh, we've actually demonstrated that. And it's amazing how these players have moved randomly, intercepted the ball regularly, you know, were in the right place at the right time. So this was all in place. And uh, in fact, I kept pushing this business of interaction between the cable and, uh, and uh, games throughout the 70s. At the highest level, uh, and nobody, uh, 10 years or so, nobody really wanted to move. One of my problems has always been that I've been ahead in te of technology with concepts by 10 years or so. For yeah. example, yeah, yeah. Go on. You are uh, Max, and for example, uh, uh, I came up with a concept of digitizing 
face, right? If you look at the disclosure sheet, on the bottom it says, item 10, digitized face of a famous person, parenthesis, NFL, National Football League quarterback. Now, eventually, yeah, I built hardware, three generations of hardware, demonstrated it, how it became uh, two games. The last one was a game called Journey, an arcade game called Journey, where four musicians uh, had their faces pasted on their characters and driving around little cars. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at uh, modern football games, you know, yeah, they do everything as I demonstrated back then. Uh, it's a long story. Uh, it gets screwed up when you never made any money. Uh, well, I mean, there are other concepts that, that I saw you made, like interactive yeah. television programs. Yeah, well, I did, I did a lot of that. Um, I don't know when you saw the black and white movie of me and my technician, Bill Harrison playing ping pong. That short segment is actually a part of a much longer movie where I demonstrate how to do, how to do impulse buying. You know, you're watching a television program. Remember, this is 1967, 68. Watching a television program, and you 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 see something you want to buy, and you, and you put uh, the telephone receiver on an acoustic cup. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly the one I'm referring to. That's exactly what I saw. Yeah, and and uh, the other that was impulse buying. Another f uh, facet of that was. Uh, uh, Impulse buying. There was several. Oh, playing, of course, playing against the ca cable, the cable providing backgrounds of active and active figures. And there was a third thing where it come, doesn't come to mind now. I pushed all this stuff in the 70s, but it was just too soon. Well, I mean, if you look at it, now there, you have two way communication from cable TV, but it's used for internet, but there is still no real interactive television. I mean, do you think it will come someday, or do you think we are just a few ways, a few ye years behind it, and it will come soon? What's your perspective? Yeah. It's as sure as snow in the winter. It's, it's just going to happen. And any time you can think of something that looks like it promises a different genre of gameplay, and start it. What I wanted to ask is, this concept of interactive program participation was uh, 40 years ago, and now we are still not there. So what do you think is the reason that, that we still don't have it? It's complicated, and, it's, and you need a ton of bandwidth. And, and, and uh, yeah, if we had uh, optical fiber all over the place, cable, then we'd probably already be here. But it's coming close, it's going to happen. I mean, there's no difference between video games and any other art form. I mean, think about it. books evolved. You know, you know, would you ask a, a, a publisher whether everything that's ever been published uh, uh, um, were done with it and uh, nothing was going to happen? It's nonsense, right? There'll always be new genres of books. There'll always be new genres of, of art. How about modern art? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you yeah. consider yourself an artist, not an inventor? Well, same thing. Uh, what I do is more art than, and, and uh, I may have 150 patents, which represents a very small portion of all the creative stuff I've done. I've done hundreds of toys and games, for example, of which maybe 10% finally wound up on the shelves of the toy stores because it's. For, yeah, if, you, if, you have, if your mind is such that ideas keep coming, then you can't take credit for it because you inherit it from some uncle or great uncle or great aunt or somebody. Right? And if, that, if, if you've got that talent, you can grind out stuff. Whether it's going to go anywhere, that's another story. Yeah. In fact, selling the, your ideas is the hard part. Uh, when I had really good marketing support, I always did much better. I have no problem with having the marketing guys drive a Cadillac while I drive a Ford, because without him, I'd be no. Yeah. Yeah, I I was actually reading a part of this marketing thing and who was first, and I remember you you said once in an interview that um, you felt a bit sorry that Atari was so successful with your Pong machine 
and that many people out there think that the Pong arcade was the starting point of video gaming, rather well, than your brown box. Well, the, the, the facts are that Nolan Bushnell, who started Atari with uh, uh, two or three other guys, uh, played a, a, a Magnavox Odyssey box on May the 22nd, I think, 72, as a dealership where the, the Odyssey was being shown to the trade. He signed the book, we have a book, the Magnavox the guest book, where he signed, he played the ping pong, ping pong game, hands on, then he hired Alan Al Alcorn, who had worked with him at Ampex before, and Alan was given the task of building an arcade pong, ping pong machine. Al knew nothing about the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the Magnavox box. He did all from scratch, yet, and he had no prior concerns. Besides what he was building, it was an arcade machine with a big board with 90 integrated circuits on it that cost about 100 bucks, whereas the bill of material in the, in the Odyssey box, that would be less than $10, right? It's a world of difference. But the, the, uh, the, the pong game, the arcade game, is a direct derivative of a ping pong game, even though Alan didn't know it at the time. Yeah, and he did a great job. And he saw so simultaneous, not quite, uh, the, uh, the home game, home, arcade, uh, home uh, uh, game business started off in May of 72, and the first Tom arcade games that came out of their primitive production operation, where, where a few guys were assembling all this stuff by hand, they came out in the summer, late summer of 72, about six months later. You know, we didn't know of each other. See, so they were kind of borrowing your idea and making an arcade, arcade machine out of it, kind of. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, nothing really exists in a vacuum. It always has some precedent. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, Simon game, right? it didn't come out of a vacuum. And Atari had a machine, an arcade machine, four big buttons on it. I played some kind of a Simon-like game. And I saw that, and I said, hey, here's a good idea of a gameplay, not a great execution, it made miserable sounds, it looked ugly, and, uh, and that's, that's how Simon was born. It didn't, wasn't born in a vacuum. So you yeah. said, so you say, sometimes it's, it's good to borrow ideas from other places and make out your own product, rather well, than making something totally new. Well, how can any, how can anything be totally new? If, if you really look close, you see, yeah, you, know, you invent a new uh, doorknob, right? There are 40,000 doorknobs out there. Uh, and six, half the parts you put in your doorknob are the same as the doorknob uh, B, C, F, and G. Uh, we, live, you know, we live and learn, and, and stuff is up there, and you make use of it. And it's bound, you know, what you're building and thinking of doing, bound to be the result of all the processes that, that uh, go on up there based on what you put up there by observing what others have done. We don't live in a vacuum. That's true. Um, what was interesting me is, I mean, did you, did you experience the, the game uh, market crash in, at the beginning of the 80s? Did you follow what happened in Japan, yeah. for example, where video gaming is part of the Society, like a huge business. Did you, yeah. did you follow what your invention led to in the in the years after? Yeah. Well, I was involved in several ways. I built a, a little gadget, which was an audio tape player for Quilico. Uh, that was called Kidvid, and the idea was to plug this into uh, Atari 2600 or Coleco's copy of the 2600. This is in. Uh, what year is this? It's 1978 or 79, when Adam first came out. Um, the, yeah, the Atari 2600 was already on, a sh on a six million shelves, you know, sitting there. My idea was, let's take them down, give them to the three-year-old and four-year-olds, and have the machine control a little audio player so you can have real music, real voices, controlled by the Atari. Yeah. You, know, you plug into the Atari back, and Atari, after all, it's a computer, can turn the 
uh, the uh, player, the audio player, tape player, off and on. And, uh, and I did this, this thing was called Kidvid. Uh, I won't blah, blah, uh, uh, yeah, I won't bother you with all the details. It didn't go very far for lots of reasons. They did a poor job of demonstrating it. So I, uh, at that time, uh, that, was, that was two or three years later, I'm in Chicago, yeah, Chicago. The Consumer Electronics Show was still in Chicago in those days. Uh, it's, it's been in Las Vegas for the longest time now, every every December or is it January. Uh, uh, who exhibited the, uh, <coughs> Nintendo with the NES machine? And they had a little bitty booth, you know, with the NES machine and that little that little robot next to it, ro ro robot you know, next to it. I looked at it and I saw immediately that the robot inter interferes. Uh, uh, one of my one of my patterns because this business of writing a code of reading a code off the screen and then doing something with it I already had an issue with that now. <clears throat> and uh, I got to talking to the guys in that little bitty booth there and when I stood outside after after the show ended waiting for uh, a cab to come out next to the guy who ran little Japanese guy my height you know short guy five six uh, 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 we talked about it. I told him how impressed I was with the NES machine, and he was very thankful and helped him about it. Uh, uh, and the next thing I know is I'm looking at the NES machine and see where it infringes. Uh, and we went after them. You know? and it was not, and it, Nintendo was notorious for never paying for anything. They only collect, they don't pay. Right? So eventually, instead of us laying a lawsuit on them. They laid a lawsuit on us, which was a very nasty one, but we won and they had to pay uh, quite a few years later. It took a long time. So wow. well, I'm very keep touch. Okay. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the insides of the, the antenna machine. We also reverse engineered it by taking the lids off the integrated circuits and looking at them under a microscope and figuring out what was going on inside of the microprocessor. Yeah. So, so, this is, so this is how, how you did reverse engineering. You did it under a microscope and take, took uh, a look. I didn't do it. One, you know, one of my engineers did it. And he, he, he's a very good programmer, a good hardware man, and we need to find out how certain things interacted. Uh, the, ba the basis of our claims was really very simple. Uh, our path is dependent upon uh, manually controlled spots on the screen like the paddles uh, interacting with a machine controlled symbol like the ball going back and forth when there was interaction like the ball bouncing off or falling down or, or the fish at the end of a, of, of a hook uh, getting caught or dropping off or wiggling. Our claims c cover that. That's as simple as it was. You know? And uh, of course they tried to disprove it. We had always had a huge advantage over of opposition because I insist when I do work for myself or when I ran a division that everybody makes good notes and no note ever gets thrown away and everything gets dated and everything gets signed and I can tell what I did on May 1st 1970 yeah, 19, when it was at 1967 at 10 o'clock in the morning because there's a piece of paper that says what I did and so we go to court and we have Eight linear feet of documents that uh, tell the uh, tell the judge exactly what we did. The opposition has, you know. Okay. Feet, uh, so so you so you say it's very important for you to keep everything documented and to understand how everything works. Not only that, to have a legal a legal path towards uh, rights. Uh, yeah. Of, uh, Especially when, if you have patents and they come in to contention, as they will when there's lots of money involved. So, but it must, it must be, it must have been hard for you back then to to make your point in front of the judge, because back then, the, even for the judges, the video industry and all the um, patents and so on, they were new. I mean, they didn't know anything about development yeah, yeah. or something. We got very lucky. The very first judge in the, uh, a series of lawsuits 
was a young guy who had just been on the bench for about two years. He'd been a practicing lawyer. And he was very, very sharp, big football player guy, but very sharp. He actually paid attention, learned the technology uh, over the over a couple of weeks of, of like to him and asked uh, I was on the stand for an entire week and I'm sitting uh he's to my right, you know, about four or five feet above me, and he's he's turning to me throughout the trial, asking questions. It it was really, uh, it was so easy for me because I knew all that stuff, you know, we generated it, and it's all there, the brown boxes over here, playing, you know, displaying and stuff. One day the opposition trundled in an arcade game. The the judge says, open it up. It goes down, we look at it. There's a regular television set inside, the front end disabled, which make, makes use of the back end, which is basically a monitor. Yeah. Well, we cover, cover the monitor versus a television set in our patents. The judge took one look at that and said, close it up. He drew his own conclusions. Right? <coughs> um, and in fact, when, uh, when he, he read the judgment off the bench at the end of the trial, and he called my 480 patent the pioneer patent of the industry. And that's how it all started. He said, we just won lawsuit after lawsuit in New York, in Chicago, San Francisco, and Ottawa. I was in, over in England, too, working with the barristers with their wigs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you say the judgment opening the machine and so on. So it was about the Pong machine, actually? That's yeah. That's what yeah. you referred to? Yeah, yeah. That's, they brought in the big Pong machine, right? And they opened and the judge says, open it up, let me see what's inside you. Know, he sees his television receipt with it, close it up. <laughs> it drew, drew the proper conclusions, you know, because I described all that in the patent too. I mean, if you want a cheap monitor, what do you do? You buy a television set, which is a lot cheaper than buying a monitor, right? You disconnect everything in front of, the, after the second, second detector, then you're at the video level, the video single level, and you have a few resistors, a couple of capacitors, and bingo, you got yourself a monitor. Yeah, for seventy-five dollars, if you went out and bought a real monitor, it'd be seven hundred fifty dollars. Right? Exactly, basically the same thing, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, how about on uh, a Commodore? Uh, was that RF? I forgot RF output or baseband output. Well, I'm not so deep into technical uh, stuff. Why well, would you plug in? When you plug it into it, uh, well, was well, was it was a video? I, well, it was audio video. It was our RGB, a chroma luma. Ah, uh, chroma luma. Yeah. So you had to have a monitor like that, except RGB. Yeah. I, for, I had a Commodore. I had every one of those things way back when. But I really uh, worked mostly with the Apple II. Many of the Apple II, IIe, and so, Steve. Yeah. What was your first computer, actually? Yeah. And Steve Wozniak has been a, become a really good friend. Yeah. You can go online and dial up Wozniak Bear. You'll see us playing a brown box at a lawyer's convention up in, uh, in, uh, in the north. We've been invited to talk to a bunch of lawyers, but it's fun watching him play 1972 game. Yeah. yeah. He's a real great guy. Fun guy. Okay. He was very helpful. Yeah, he was very helpful too. He was on a committee that decided who gets the National Medal of Technology, which the President of the United States hung around my neck, 2006. He was also uh, helpful in getting me into the National uh, 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 what is it? Uh, Inventors Hall of Fame. So I'm in good company with the Edisons and the and uh, the Marconis. <laughs> yes, that was mentioned. actually one of my next questions. How did that happen? I mean, I mean, I must, I must um, imagine it, it. It has to be very, I don't know, confusing or like being hard to believe that the president of the United States is going to give you a, mod, um, a medal to honor you for your achievement. So how yeah. was it for you back then? Well. Well, it was a mixed bag because uh, we w- we went there, went to the White House uh, East Room on a Tuesday, 
and my wife died on the Friday before. So the whole family was there except her, and so it was a mixed thing. But we were all dressed up to the nines and, and the best clothes, and spent about an hour and a half in the White House with all that beautiful uh, uh, furniture and pictures and stuff. And each of the honorees for the day had a, had a, had a guide. I had a Marine captain who was a doctor, actually. Uh, and then we uh, entered the, uh, the, uh, the East Room. Uh, you've probably see, seen it. The president making, making uh, 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 hang, hanging medals around so, a soldier's neck or something. Oh, it always happens in the East Room. It's a large, very large room. And af afterwards, um, we had a private meeting with uh, the president. The whole idea is to incentivize young people to go into engineering. That's the whole purpose. Ah, okay. So, so I had a background thought about, about meeting you, too. Uh, so we, we talked about how to do this. Yeah. There were some people that were there uh, from IBM, others who represented the work done at the company, you know, like their own ideas. Uh, something I'm into right now, trying to get eight to 16 year olds uh, involved in learning, learning how to program, build stuff, hands on, not just plug things together as somebody else program, you know, and push buttons, but actually do the software and then see something happen that really works. You know, uh, that's my uh, current thing I'm working on. So, oh yeah, well, I've got lots and lots of other honors. Sony uh, uh, had a, uh, uh, a, uh, an annual, uh, annual prize through the IEEE Institute of Electrical and uh, Electronic Engineers, where I'm a fellow, fe finally made me a fellow, my fellow. Uh, and then I had a nice big fat che check attached to it. You know. Great. <laughs> the only one, I mean, I've, I've lectured all over the place, and I've been in Germany, God knows how many times, talking in Köln, talking in Leipzig. Uh, and Leipzig was a funny thing. First of all, Köln had a, had a game developers conference, and Leipzig had another one. A few days later, and they're like this, right, trying to compete for, for, for attendance. And when, when I get to Leipzig, uh, the first two speakers are the, are the provincial uh, uh, president, you know, and he's a six foot four type, Germanic type, you know, this is tall. And afterwards, I think the Bürgermeister or something, something like that speaks, so he's all the six foot four, nine, five, six. You know. So I get up there, <laughs> I look down, there's a, a group of, uh, of uh, uh, the Taiwan, I think they were Taiwanese, but little oriental guys, my size, I said, no point, I said, I'm glad you're here, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only short guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so you are still traveling nowadays? Well, I haven't been traveling for a year because I've been pretty sick this year. Oh. I am. 91, you know, the plumbing is old, the wiring is old, um, and there have been a few disasters this year. Oh, I hope keep you're doing better now. Oh, I'm better. I'm good enough so I can go downstairs and work my lab, you know, I've worked for the last 35 years, cranking out new stuff. Uh, what else would I do? I mean, why I've been dead since 2006, uh, rattling around alone in a big house. Uh, work. Of course, yeah. of course. I mean, you are still an inventor. Why not doing it, what you, what you are used to do? Um, what, what, what interests me is you are very deep into technology. I mean, now we are speaking over Skype. And what's your perspective on people, on elderly people who say this new technology and so on is too complicated for us? Well, you know it's getting user friendly. Maybe maybe a new idea is, has too many buttons on it and too complicated. Within a year, it gets cleaned up. So, and nobody seems to be afraid of anything. Look at pe people using iPhones or uh, comparable phones. I mean, they're very complex, but they have no problem using. Get used to it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's a multi-touch thing and so on. Yeah, in fact, I mean. Uh, you're so used to touching things that sometimes I reach over to my computer screen, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and 
when nothing happens, right? <laughs> um, what? What, was, what was interesting me is, what's your opinion about some things um, that happens regarding the video game business in the recent 10, 14 years, uh, like tragic um, experiences like um, school, uh, school shootings and so on that happened in, in USA, Germany and Norway recently? I mean, yeah. I mean, if you compare like uh, 20, 30 years ago, computer games were with crude graphics and mm -hmm. very simple. Do you think um, it has to do with the graphics that are better, or why? Why is there more violence? I mean, why? Why does this even happen? What's your perspective? I mean, it's hard to believe that a video game is making you a killer or something. No. I I think if you have psychotic tendency, especially teenagers who go through a depression or, or get picked on in school, and some kids are psychotic to begin with, eh? not everybody's normal. You know? If normal were universal, there wouldn't be any normal. It's just everybody would be the same. You know, oh, but there's no, this is just no denying that we live in a much more volatile and violent society than uh, we did. 30, 50 years ago. Besides, uh, what do you want? I mean, when I came to this country in 30 years, there were 150 million people here. Now we've got 350. I mean, that's somebody everywhere, right? Makes a big difference. And a whole lot of them are not very good citizens, right? Uh, right. <laughs> There'll always be crime. Yes. And, and you know, violence is so popular. I mean, what, what do people look at on the screen? They like violent movies. They like, you know, violent books. You know, violent books have been around for the longest time. Yeah, yeah. yeah so nothing new. Okay. So okay. you think you think this violent problem has nothing to do with video games because that is what politics are telling us since since the last well, ten years. Well, I wouldn't put it quite that way. I'm sure that. Some of the, uh, the psychotic kids uh, who have been sitting there playing video games for 18 hours a day, um, uh, uh, that, that was a part of why they went over the. Ah, okay. um, yeah. I mean, you can't make black and white judgments. It's, you know, life is complicated and it, and it gets more and more complicated. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and especially when. At a time like uh, now, when you go out and get out of school and you can't find a job, uh, you know, replacing the jobs with machines, or we're shipping the jobs over to China or, 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 or to Malaysia or some other place like that, it's tough. True. Yeah. And the thing is, when we don't teach our kids respect for knowledge, we don't make them read, that's the biggest problem. Kids do not read. But if you don't read, how do you pick up language? How do you pick up facility with language? How do you think? Yeah, you know, in other than very crude forms, you think like you text. Well, that's not language. So it's it's a bigger social problem there. It's not only related to video games. No, it's a huge social problem. Especially because I remember you even you even made a shotgun for that brown box if I'm if I'm right right Kanye. so um, so you 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 thought about ways to to use real um, I don't know real tools and combine them with, with video games well I think about it if all you can if you if your capability for doing something on the screen is a single spot out there which you can move around what can you do with a single spot well obviously sure to the damn thing right so, but, but back then you did um, a screen overlay, if I'm not mistaken, right? Well, yeah, we has, we did a lot of overlays, but on a ping pong game, for example, we line down the middle, you don't need an overlay, right? Or handball, you put the line on the left-hand side of the screen, you bounce the ball off that, you don't need an overlay. The overlays made things look much prettier, you know, and they were an art form in themselves, you know, early overlays. Magnavox had some really good-looking overlays especially for the shooting game. You know, you have these games of, a game of a dark building with the windows backlit by, by the spot, you know, and, one, and oh, here's another point. 
every game we built was a two-player game. The concept of one guy playing against the machine didn't exist. The whole thing was supposed to be a family thing. Right? Two people playing. I mean, it would have been even hard because there was not something like artificial intelligence back then, right? No, heck no. <laughs> I mean, there were no computers, no, you know, big computers, you know, but the personal computer was 10 years off. Integrated circuits is just, just become, becoming used, too expensive for us to use, too power hungry, too, too much current. And the idea of a wall transformer to, to feed this thing, that was a no no. That was an extra five dollars, which is like five, 25 bucks now. That was a no no. Had to be battery operated. So when you have a battery operated device, you need to worry about the current drawn so the batteries last. So you design, all along, you design for minimum current. Uh, uh, for example, the uh, uh, the uh, flip flat, or the uh, oh yeah the, the generators they generated the the ball and the hand. I used to take eight transistors, and my technician Bill Harrison came up with a scheme to do it with four. Right? So we saved three times four, actually with a line four, about sixteen transistors. Even if they were just a nickel, that's 90 cents. It's almost a dollar, right? Uh, when you do com com consumer products, you deal with fractions of a cent. I just designed something that's going to be produced to, on the shelves next third quarter, 14. The microprocessor inside, in chip form, has a capability for 60 seconds worth of speech, to play the speech backwards, forwards, slow, fast, and tons and tons of input output IO is 27 cents in die form. I mean, here's this machine with millions of transistors on it, 27 cents. Yeah, an ordinary integrated circuit that had maybe 25 transistors in it used to cost a dollar, two dollars. Right? And it's just a completely different world. It's all bloody magic now. And people are so, so blasé about the magic, you know. Of course it works, right? <laughs> well, you say it's magic, but of course you know a bit about what's behind it. So for you it's not magic. Yeah, but, but it's still magic, because it, the complexity is unbelievable, you know. And whereas a guy like me could put his arms around what we were building, I, I built medical equipment, I built amateur radio equipment, I built communications equipment, uh, of course lots of military equipment, I could understand the whole thing and build the whole thing, keep the whole damn schematic in my, my mind. I mean, today, guys work on a, a little part like this out of a thing like this. And that's so complex, they can spend a lifetime working on that and improving it. It's just a completely different world. Of course, now you have a team. Now you have a team of a lot of people who have to work together to make things done. And back then, you did it all on your own. Of course, that makes sense. Yeah, well, on a comedy, you, you, you program your own game, you know, one person, right? Uh, the Atari 2600, most of the early games were done by one person. The whole nine months, everything, including the music, right? Uh, that is true. That is true. Now, now it takes 100 people to do a game, and it costs 10 million bucks or more, right? or even, even 20 or 30 million dollars, like a movie production. Which was, which would interest me is um, you are speaking about um, composers, coders, graphics who did who did the game. Did you follow? Um, did you follow famous people? I don't know, like Javontal who did the video game music, or Chris Hulsbeck, or um, or uh, or. No, yeah. no I, I, I really didn't after after the seventies. I really didn't do much until uh, I think it was 89. In 89, I, I presented to outfits like Konami and others who came to my lab. Uh, the kind of stuff that the we first generation we did. This is 89. <laughs> yeah. I had this little character on the screen tracking me. He knew where I was. 
because I had five zones in the room, you could move around. He knew what it was. I could hide behind a chair, pop out, try to get a shot at him, and he tried to knock me off. So he had the spatial recognition stuff. We were throwing things at the north north walls of the screen, and then, yeah, and, uh, uh, we had uh, we took one of the, the mats. I forgot who made the mats. I think it was Nintendo uh, dance mat and made it into a controller. So you can play every game with your feet, either sitting down or standing up, which was completely novel. And we showed all this to, to Konami and to Milton Bradley, who were trying to get into the game, and, and a number of others. And nobody, they all signed non disclosure agreements. Uh, Konami ripped me off on something. I showed him my helmet with, okay. a, with, a, with, a, uh, with an eyesight. Uh, and the demonstration was on Apple too, with airplanes passing by, and you could put a side on the airplane, and then yell at the mic, the mic, shoot or whatever. You know, hit it, and you'd see an explosion symbol wherever you were looking. You did all the stuff in '89, and didn't didn't sell one nickel's worth. Then I did a uh, more recently, about four years ago, a uh, device that was a substitute for a dance mat. Instead of a mat, it was just a little flat thing that you could stood on and, and uh, it was up or stood near to it. It was an optical thing. Konami did that one. They made a big mistake. They didn't ro romance the internal people, they didn't romance management. But when they were done, I spent a million dollars. Management said, no, we don't want to do it. So, so you, you, got, you got in touch with the video game industry just 89, you say? Uh, 89, 90, yeah, more recently, but three, three years ago, four years ago, through Konami. <coughs> but things are so complex, so I mean, there's no way I can play a part in there. <laughs> of course. I don't, really, I don't really want to. I like coming up with a concept and doing the whole thing. And I'm working on a little truck right now. It does a lot of neat things. So I go out and buy a little plastic truck, I cut it apart. I put all kinds of sensors into it, yeah, a microprocessor into it, and it, now it does all sorts of neat tricks and speaks and makes noises, and, yeah. And I do everything. You know. I do all all the mechanical work. I do the circuit design and the photo boards. I do the final circuit design. I assemble it, make it all work. I do all the software on it. So you're also, a you're also a programmer. You also make the code yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I learned how to do that because uh, this way I can do the whole thing myself. I, I don't depend on it. But it's never going to be the final code. Just good enough to demonstrate uh, the concept. You know. And then I do, usually do a movie of what I did. You know, send it to my marketing guy. If he likes it, uh, I'll send him a model, and he'll try to parlay it into a license and maybe one out of ten makes it all the way. So it keeps me busy. So you, you say, um, so nowadays you are still learning new stuff. This this keeps yeah. you forward and motivated. Yeah, and also I'm relearning stuff because for the six months hiatus when I was really sick this year, a whole lot of stuff just disappeared. If you don't use it, you lose it. Mm. And it's amazing how fast the stuff disappears when you don't use it. And sometimes in the middle of the night I'm in bed I'm thinking of something that uses a part I've used a hundred times before, a thousand times. Can't think of the part number. Can I get out of bed, get online, get on the computer, type in the yeah, description, yeah, free input and gate, boom, you know, it comes up. And I don't even have to go down and look at the, the book. It's the, so easy to do it through the computer. It's all there. It's just a fantastic world we live in. It's complete, complete magic. Well, it's in one way fantastic, but don't you think it's also a bit too overwhelming for people? Too much information? Well, yeah. Well, that's 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 a problem. It's going to be an even bigger problem. And other problems are coming along. How about robots, right? Well. I mean, how long before your cell phone and my cell phone starts talking to the, each other without us being on the line? Like, 
you know, my cell phone calls you up and says, you know what my guy did today, that idiot, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, that that must be very scary, like like in movies where robots have just their own mind. Yeah, well, it's scary because it's going to happen. You think it's going to happen? Oh, no, oh, no doubt about it. You can endow these machines with so much intelligence, so that you can ask them as if you were you asking another human, what do you expect it to do? So if they do nothing, it's going to stop. It already does things. You're asking. Well, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? The damn thing speaks, right? And recognize you. Recognize <laughs> you mean Siri, say. for example. Yeah. Yeah, Siri. Yeah. It's only the beginning. Because within 10 years, we have microprocessors that have 10 times, 20 times, 30 times the capability. Today's microprocessors are a completely different structure inside. I mean, there's so many new ways of, of handling silicon and other uh, materials under study. Yeah, everywhere. Uh, it's all going to happen. You know? and, and what do you do with all this capability? You make things more and more automatic. All in the world, well, the average person doesn't even know when you t what's inside when you turn the door door knob. Yeah, I mean, no concept of what anything is going on. So let's take it all for granted. You know, yeah. So let me ask you, how, how do you proceed? For example, you buy a new device. Do you have, do you have your, your um, I mean, do you have the need or do you want to know how things work? Are you still trying to dig into um, devices, how they work, what the contents are behind them? No, because uh, at the level at which technology, at which I work, which is at least 20 years old, <laughs> uh, I, I I can't I can't possibly want to study how Siri works. I mean, I mean that's the that's the end result of twenty or thirty years of work, or even more, forty years of work with hundreds, if not thousands, of people involved, mostly mathematicians. You're know, working at a very high level of of uh, complexity. There's no way you can keep up with that. You can just appreciate it because uh, you know if you're an engineer like me and. Uh, I was pretty damn good at math at one time. In fact, I was so good at math that my math always wound up as teaching material at the University of Texas in Austin, Texas. <clears throat> and, uh, but I look at my notes and I can't get past, past page one. I haven't used this stuff, it just disappeared. And I really didn't need it. But, what not, I, but, not, but not all of your stuff disappeared. I mean, oh, you, you even wrote your own book. Yeah. Oh yeah, I wrote lots of books. I, I have a bio, it's not published yet. It's in iBook format, that's about 500 pages long, full of movies, right? How do you write your bio now? Why would I want to write well, a book on, my book on video games, video games, you know, video games in the beginning. It's now six, seven, eight years old. I have a new version and it's full of movies. So it can only live on, you know, on the screen. And why would I want to talk about the brown box without demonstrating how to play this game? It doesn't make any sense. Right? Not in this day and age. So people don't have to go to YouTube, they just can watch the video in the ebook. Yeah, right. And in various formats, the iBook format for the iPad. And, yeah. <coughs> wow. It's very, it's very expensive, though. You do all this programming. Of course. That also, that also become cheaper and cheaper as time goes. It's like a new, brand new publishing industry being created out there. Yeah, it's got growing pains. Is there anything you you regret about the video game business you you are, you have created? Is there anything you would have made different on a perspective if you look back? No. I don't think so because we, we, even if you look at my very first five five page document, there's a whole lot of ideas in there that really happened, right? It became games. In addition to that, if you look at what we did with game number two, uh, early 1967, we had joysticks, we had wired controls, we had a, uh, a, a golf ball at the end of a joystick for a putting game, yeah, we had light guns. 
I mean, think about it. We had all this stuff way back when, plus a whole bunch of concepts, certainly steering wheels, and, you know, and all of which happened. Yeah. So, uh, and then I sat down with Bill Rush, who was an engineer, worked with us for about three or four months, was very creative, and came up with a huge list of, of ga games uh, that we could play with the technology once we had the, the um, interaction on the control. And, and you, you take two creative guys, you put in a room, you come up with tons of stuff, that some of which won't really happen until 10 years later because the technology is not ready. So you are, you, are, you are still thinking ahead what, what will happen in the future. Well, we, you're wishing you could do it, you know, and you're looking to, to do it, and you do some of it in the primitive form in which you could do it with existing hardware, but um, you uh, being patent conscious, you know, you have all these ideas, and it's stupid not to uh, try and protect them so that once they really happen out there, you might actually make some money of, of all the time and energy. After all, you spend money, time, and energy. You deserve to be compensated. That's what the patent system is for. Of course. Yeah, your froze. picture froze. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, you're back. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. You got somebody sending 20 gillion, gillion megabits down the, down the pipe. <laughs> okay. Thing, things slow down. What would be your, your last words in the interview? What? Uh, what would you like to tell us for the people who read the, uh, who see the video? Well, I'd like to see more guys go into engineering. I mean, there are tons and tons of job openings out there for, for engineers and mathematicians and potential scientists, and everything else goes begging, you know, because being replaced by machines. You know. So, what I want is to see kids go through trade schools rather than college. I mean, forget about the Roman history, you know. Uh, <laughs> and make the kids read, but uh, you don't have to really, you can acquire uh, culture by reading all on your own. You don't have to learn it. In fact, it's much better off acquiring it when you're older, a little more mature, you can assess what's, what Homer wrote in in uh, yeah, 263 or whenever you wrote this stuff, you know, the Odyssey, or, uh, and when you're a little older, you know, uh, I uh, really think people ought to look towards uh, the bright kids, look towards technology, and start designing stuff, building stuff, getting really solid physics, math background. Uh, uh, you don't only have to go through a four year university. Uh, system to do that. You can do that in two, two and a half years. Right? And then you can you start on the bottom and you work hands on. Yeah. yeah, so you know what you're doing. But it's, it's we have this this idea that uh, college is a college time is four years of fun and, and uh, yeah, goofing off fun while parents are going into debt, right? It's very expensive. That's another thing. I went to college after the war on the GI Bill of Rights. It didn't, didn't cost me a nickel. I was a soldier for three years, you know, back in England, France, Germany. Yeah. So that's what we should do again. We should make it possible for talented kids who want to go into engineering, or science, and have to get a free education. Lots of other countries do it. But, yeah. I can't find that, fight that battle by myself. I'm trying to influence it by what I'm doing right now, you know, working on ways to teach, I said that earlier, 18, 16 year olds, how to build stuff, do everything. Build it, program it, get the pleasure out of seeing something that actually built. That's some kit they put together, yeah, uh, with somebody else's software driving things. That's no way to learn. I mean, what good is it for me to be able to push buttons to control a robot when I really don't know anything what's going on in the processor or how that uh, 
uh, uh, that the servo mechanism works. End of the story. Okay. Well, thanks for for telling us your story and what you do, and I hope you you have a good success with your plan, especially yeah, well, in in getting more people and more child into engineering. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope so. It was my pleasure. Good luck to you. <laughs>